Welcome to the Performance Enhancing Podcast. It's like steroids for your brain. A podcast for people that want the best info, but just don't have the time. Get your podcast fix with the Cliff Notes versions of your favorite podcasts. No fluff, just the actionable golden nuggets. Having this much knowledge at your fingertips should be downright illegal. So get ready for another dose of Performance Enhancing Podcast with Satori Prime. Here's your host, Elon Ferdman. Hello, hello, everyone. Welcome to another Performance Enhancing Podcast episode with me, Elon Ferdman of Satori Prime. And I'm going back to doing a quote-unquote book review or my golden nugget takeaways from a book that I just recently finished. Now, I'm not sure if this will be a two-part series or a three-part series, but we definitely cannot cover all the material in one. So I'll see how long each section takes me to cover, and uh, we'll base it off of that. So the book I'm going to cover today is a book by Joe Navarro called What Everybody Is Saying. And... I'd never read anything like this before, but was highly recommended, and it's all about non-behavioral communication. So in other words, everything other than speech coming out of the mouth, our hands, our eyes, our face, our body, uh, torso, legs, feet, the whole deal, what do those tell us? So without any more introduction, I just want to kind of give you guys an idea of who Joe Navarro is and why this book I think is so wildly popular. So Joe Navarro worked as an FBI special agent and supervisor in the area of counterintelligence and behavioral assessment for 25 years. He's one of the founding members of the FBI's elite behavioral analysis program, and he also served as a SWAT team commander and bureau pilot. But since retiring from the FBI, Navarro started writing books and speaking at lectures to share his knowledge of human behavior. So in 2005, interestingly enough, Joe started working with the World Series of Poker Academy, actually training players on how to read poker players' tells. And he's ultimately known for the book we're going to cover today, which is what everybody is saying. In fact, he sold 150,000 copies of this book, and it's been translated into 16 different languages. Now, Another side note, and this is a book that I've just added to my uh, read list, one that I hope to share with you guys in the future, is his most recent book, Louder Than Words, was elected in 2010 by the Wall Street Journal as one of the six best business books to read for your career, just to give you an idea of how well-versed this guy is. Now, this book, like I said, really gave me a new perspective on dealing with people face-to-face. And I think a lot of the social anxiety issues that people have, if they, you know, if we were only taught these skills from an early on age, I think we would be much better communicators. I think we'd be able to read the room much better, if you will, which would give us actions that we would take and feel comfortable with. So I took a whole bunch of notes. In fact, I think my notes are like 15, 17 pages long. So again, we'll break this up into sections, but I think if anyone is dealing with any interpersonal relationships, whether you're dating, uh, you want to find out how your relationship with your wife or husband is, your kids, how your kids are interacting at school with other kids. If you even take 10% of what I'm going to share with you over these next two or three sections, uh, you'll have huge insights into how the human body can give us secrets into how people are truly feeling. Okay, so let's dive right in. Uh, I know in most of my other ones, if you guys are watching the video, I tend to kind of look at the screen, but in this one, I have so many notes, I'm just going to have to kind of like read a little bit of as we go through this, and uh, for those listening, it doesn't really matter. (laughs) All right, so let's jump right in. So nonverbal behavior actually makes up between 60 to 65% of all of our communications. So if you think about it, we focus at best at only about 35 to 40% of communication, which is what comes out of people's mouths. So things like facial expressions, body movements, timber in people's voices, posture, how people are holding their hands, etc., are all considered nonverbal behavior. So what you want to understand before we start talking about examples is that these behaviors, these movements are actually way more honest because people aren't aware of them. And we'll talk about how we've been taught to lie with certain parts of our body and our speech 
versus the parts of our body that are controlled by reptilian part of our brain, which is uncontrolled by, you know, 99% of us, unless you've been taught about these things, which is the other interesting caveat is like, once I was aware of these things, you start checking into your body in certain situations. And if you see that you're holding yourself a certain way, you end up actually adjusting because you're like, oh, wait, you know, I'm giving off this signal. So it's really interesting. So I'll give you just a quick example, and then we can jump, jump right into some of these things. So people that like you, when you walk into a room, will actually raise their eyebrows versus people that don't like you will either squint or close their eyes, which is called eye blocking. So just something to notice when you walk into a room, if you ever thought that someone disliked you, then you can check out for these telltale signs, right? So here's what I want to just set as the context, right? So just like listening is important to understand people's speech, observation is immensely important when you're talking about people's physical communications. So just like you wouldn't wear earplugs if you want to really listen, well, most people, when we're observing other people, are kind of wearing blindfolds. So we're just completely not in tune to this other world of communication that is happening, which is actually the dominant way that humans communicate. So before we get started, Joe Navarro actually set forth 10 commandments to follow. And if you follow these 10 commandments, you can start creating that muscle, if you will, of observation. And I'll just tell you, just from having done you know 12 years of personal development work, listening active listening is not something that comes naturally to people because the way most people listen is they're waiting for their turn to speak they're listening to someone but what they're thinking about is they're interpreting what that person is saying and all they're trying to come up with is what's the next thing that i'm going to say which is not listening listening is actually being there listening fully present not thinking of what there is to say but just actually being engaged with that person and you know what? That's a muscle that takes a lot of time to develop and it's constantly being developed. So here are the 10 commandments one needs to follow in order to even start building this muscle of observation. So commandment number one, situational awareness, being aware of your surroundings, not only visual. So when you walk into an apartment, right, take a deep breath, smell, do you detect smoke? Are there any unusual smells that could alert you to danger? This is the kind of stuff that's not taught in schools, which is why we're deficient. But, you know, I think Joe shared a quick story where he walked into his room, into his apartment and smelled a strange odor, like a strange cologne of some sort and automatically knew that someone had been in his apartment. And sure enough, he found that certain documents or things were stolen. But if he hadn't even had that situational awareness, he would have never observed that. Number two, the more you understand the context, the better you'll be at observation. So for example, after a car accident, people are likely to make irrational decisions. Or say at a job interview, people are, are gonna be expected to be a little bit nervous and that should dissipate over time. But if that shows up again during a certain line of questioning, then those should send red flags. Now, if you just take everything as a one-off thing like oh my god this person has sweaty palms they're uncomfortable well some people just have sweaty palms right but then as they get more comfortable that kind of goes away but if that comes back then now you know that there's something that you should be observing okay number three learn to recognize universal body language so for example lip compression which is puckering lips uh exemplifies displeasure and we'll talk a lot about and we'll talk a lot about these different uh, universal body languages. Number four, idiosyncratic body behavior or basically behavior that is specific to the individual. So some people always sweat, right? Like we were just talking about the palms. So sweating ne wouldn't necessarily be a telltale sign of distress for that person. You got to kind of get the baseline of that person and then see if their actions or their body is acting differently than that baseline. That's number four. Number five, try to get a handle on people's baseline behavior, how they hold their hands or feet, where they place their valuables. Uh, you need to know how they act normally versus when they're stressed. 
Okay, that's number five. Number six, look for people multiple tells or tells in succession. And I think we'll wrap up this section probably with that concept. Number seven, look for changes in a person's behavior. In other words, if they get bad news on the phone, right? You, you see things happen. If someone has nasal expansion when their nose is expanding, it means that they're about to take action. Uh, there's a story that Joe had shared that his dad used to own a pawn shop and he worked there during the summer one time and he noticed that this guy was just kind of standing around looking at the cash register, right? Now, if someone was just standing around looking at the cash register, that wouldn't necessarily be something that you would jump on, right? But it was for Joe something that he took notice of. Now, as soon as he saw the gentleman's nose start to flare, he knew that the gentleman was about to take action. So he immediately ran to the cash register and completely diffused the situation automatically only because he was looking for the way that things were stacking, right? Like the universal body language, things in succession. So that is number seven. Number eight, you wanna be able to detect false behavior. Number nine, distinguish between comfort and discomfort. And number 10, this is what I thought was really uh, smart and I kind of played this. So I read this book on vacation and I'll share a story with you of, of what I started observing. But you want to be subtle when observing others. So, you know, just like people don't like being stared at, you can't really just like stare at people to watch. Okay, so let's jump right into the science of all this. And the book starts by explaining that there are three parts of the human brain, the limbic, the neocortex, and the reptilian. And let me explain what each one of these is. We've spoken about these in other podcasts, but always good to do a refresher. Limbic brain is the part of the brain that's never off and is always responding to outside world. And by virtue of that, it is the most honest part of the brain. It, it delivers the most honest behaviors. Neocortex is in fact the least reliable. This is the part that can deceive and we use to do so quite often. It allows us to lie, it allows us to manipulate. This is the part that creates complex speech. And the last one, which we're going to be talking about probably the most, is the reptilian brain. This is the part of the brain that has just been part of us for eons. It is the one that deals with fight or flight reactions. Now, Joe makes a distinction, which I'd never heard before, but is actually very, very smart, which is fight or flight is not fully accurate. It's actually before fight or flight, there's one other piece, which is freeze. So the totality of it is freeze, flight, or fight in that exact order. So freeze first, flight, run, or fight. Those are the three options. And those are all controlled by the reptilian brain. So let's look at these, right? So freeze, if you think about it, is kind of that play dead response. And he was talking about students in Columbine. Some of them actually play dead because that is truly a human being's first line of defense. So today, when people feel threatened or exposed or caught lying, they tend to freeze up, okay? Just like if you heard a strange noise, like an alarm in the middle of the night or you know while you were working and it was unexpected, you notice that everyone just freezes, almost have like that deer in headlights, like, oh shit, what do we do now? Um, those are the kind of actions that we take that our brain has just programmed in it when a stressful situation occurs. So let me give you something that's a little more subtle of how this plays out in the body. So for example, if someone is made uncomfortable during an interview or asking a line of questions, like when Joe would, would interrogate people, if they interlock their legs behind a chair, that means they're uncomfortable. That is that same freeze reaction occurring within the body when someone's in a more social interaction, okay? So that's freeze. So now let's look at flight. When a threat is too close, our brain trained us to run. But today we simply physically distance ourselves from things that we dislike. So for example, if we're leaning away or put objects on our lap in, you know, in front of us or stand behind a chair, uh, if we point our legs to an exit, 
if we close our eyes or begin rubbing our face. These are actions of people being uncomfortable or unhappy. These are the same type of flight reactions, like I'm trying to get away reactions that have been programmed in our brain, uncontrolled by most of us. And then lastly, we have fight. Fight is always, always a last resort. That's when we turn our fear into rage. Now, in today's world, that can be an argument. So we'll use insults. We'll counter people's allegations. We'll use sarcasm. We'll use uh, a degrading professional stature. During the fight process, our cognitive abilities are hijacked to, in order to become more fight mode. So all reason goes out the window, right, once we go into this mode. So now that we understand those freeze, flight, or fight responses, there's another thing that we need to start looking at, which Joe calls the comforting or pacifying our discomfort. So the limbic brain seeks safety and survival. So I'll give you an example. It's basically the difference between someone being in a hammock, right? Very, very comfortable, relaxed, happy, peaceful, etc., versus someone when their flight is delayed, right? And they're at the airport and people get really stressed out and crabby and all that kind of stuff. So the limbic brain, what you guys need to understand is like a computer. Every negative and positive event that's ever occurred to you in your life is stored in this mega computer. So if you run into a class bully 20 years later, you'll still have the same exact reaction that you had when you were back in high school. Because in the brain, it doesn't look at time. It is trying to constantly make sure you survive. So if it sees someone who used to be a threat, it is going to pull up that memory and create a world that is very threatening for you at that moment. And so your body's going to react a certain way. You're probably going to sweat. You're probably going to want to run across the street. All of the things that you used to do when you were 14, 15 years old are going to come back even if you're 30, 40, or 50 years old. That's crazy, right? Now, on the flip side of that, it's also responsible for bringing upon feelings of euphoria when you see an old friend that you haven't seen for a long time. Or do you ever notice if you smell something, some smell that reminds you of your childhood, how you kind of like immediately go into that place? That's all part of that limbic brain. And so again, it's there to protect us and also there to store all these things in order to protect us, okay? So what are pacifying behaviors? When the limbic brain senses a threat, okay, it automatically sends a signal to your body to pacify that threat. So when people touch their neck, okay? So women, what Joe was saying, tend to touch the dimple right uh, where the neck meets the chest area that like uh, right under the Adam's apple for guys kind of there's a dimple so they if you ever notice women will be out and you can notice it all the time I mean ever since he shared this I've been seeing it everywhere uh, but when women touch their neck dimple it means that they're uncomfortable it is basically the limbic brain asking you know pacify me pacify me pacify me so now it doesn't always mean that people are lying when they're in those situations, but it does mean that they're troubled by either the situation or the question or maybe even the person in front of them. Now, there are many pacifying behaviors. So, for example, uh, people touching their neck, their face, uh, their hair. You know, you know, a lot of people are constantly, I'm, I'm, I tend to be one of them. Uh, I know my brother is one of them as well. We play with our hair. Uh, women always play with their hair. Uh, touching your shoulder, touching your arm. It's basically the brain just asking for you to pacify it by touching something in the body. Uh, for specific to men, men will play with their face, men will play with a pen, or if you notice, fix their shirt or tie. That's a big, big one for men. And women tend to touch their neck, uh, will play with their necklaces, and specifically women who are pregnant, which I thought was really interesting to, to witness because a, a few of my uh, girlfriends are pregnant right now, is that they will go from their neck to their stomach, right? So almost like that protective, pacifying, uh, motherly instinct kicks in. So a couple of other ones to just take notice of, uh, whistling, tapping of the pencil, excessive yawning, which 
kind of shocked me a little bit. Uh, leg cleansing, which is basically when you slide your hands down your leg towards your knees. So when people are sitting at interviews a lot of the times, you'll actually see them kind of like rubbing their uh, their thighs going down to their knees. So uh, just some things to be aware of. Now, one of the most interesting things I learned was what is the most honest part of the body? And this is the one I think we'll, we'll try to cover all in uh, this section. So if you had to guess what's the most honest part of the human body, what would you guess? I'll give you a couple of seconds here. Okay, hopefully you all have some, some sort of answer in your brain right now. Well, it's the feet. The feet tell you the most honest things about what the person is feeling. The feet are, in fact, the most honest part of the human body. Why? So feet have reacted to threat for millions of years. Even before we had language, feet were the things that helped us survive. So they would help us freeze. They would help us run. They would help us feel things if they were hot. They would let us kick things, right? They would protect us. So feet for a human being locked into that brain is the most honest part because right now it is the part that has just been programmed for eons to actually uh, protect us. And that's just been locked in. So even though we don't have the same threats like, you know, a lion jumping out at us or large animals chasing us or freezing cold or whatever, all of that methodology is still ingrained. And so it's just showing up differently now. And if you know how to observe those different things, then you have access to some really, really powerful knowledge about what other people are thinking. So all this stuff has just been programmed into the limbic brain. Again, that card catalog file, right? So ultimately, little has changed in 5 million years. Feet stretch to the floor or squirm towards where they want to be. Uh, if you need any proof, and this is something you mentioned and I started observing, is look at children. So especially when children are sitting in the high chair, like when I'm feeding my son or my daughter, um, as soon as they get excited by something, they their feet go nuts, right? Like really, really, really happy feet. And as soon as they want to, they're done, like even if I'm trying to still feed them, they will squirm, they will move, they will try to get out, and you just see their feet doing this crazy, crazy dance. So really interesting things to observe. So if I could share anything with you is, concentrate on people's feet and legs first. The fact is, whether you know this or not, uh, we lie with our faces and we do so all the time. And again, it's because we've been taught to do so from a very young age. So I'll give you a couple of examples. How many of you guys have ever heard the saying, don't give me that look? So when parents will put a food in front of a kid that he doesn't like and he gives them that like really sour look, they'll say something like, don't give me that look. Or, um, Something like, at least pretend to be happy when, you know, your cousins come over or something like that. Or, hey, put on a happy face for, you know, the sake of keeping a social situation clean, right? We've all been told that. Like, you ever walk into a house where you know the couple just had a massive, massive fight and then they open the door is like, hi, how are you? But you just know, like, something really bad just happened. But that's people lying with their face. And we all do this all the time. So feet, on the other hand, are very, very telltale. So feet could be jumping, wiggling, bouncing. Like if you see lovers meet at an airport for the first time, just notice people's feet anxiously waiting, right? And then they see the other person and how happy they get. Um, so feet are great and all, right? But the problem you might be thinking to yourself is, well, I can't really see people's feet. So how am I going to actually observe this? So I want you to try a small exercise that Joe had shared, and I, and I tried this, and it's quite fascinating, but sit in front of a mirror and do different movements with your feet, you know, jump your feet, um, so like, like I'm doing now, uh, cross your legs, okay, move them behind the chair, all these kind of things and start playing around, and you'll quickly find that distinct leg movements will most certainly affect the upper body as well, right? So when I'm doing this, if you guys are watching the video, 
there's absolutely action in my shoulders, in my torso, which ends up moving my neck and head, right? And again, this is a muscle. So if you observe these things and you learn to observe these things, then you actually have ammunition. So that's what he actually taught a lot of the poker players because a lot of people, you can't see people's feet under the table, right? But when you're aware of what happens in the torso, by virtue of what's happening below, then you have access to power. And it's like I said before, you know, you have to practice actively listening and you definitely have to practice observing because again, this for most of us is very, very new science. So I'll just share with you a quick thing. Like I said before, I read this book on vacation and uh, was in the pool while a couple was actually tasting uh, food. So they were looking to throw an event and they, it was them two sitting there and they had the chef and I guess the general manager or whomever is sitting across from them and you know, waiters would bring out food and they would taste a few dishes and give them feedback on whether they wanted it or not. And what I found fascinating is I was in a pool, so kind of below where they were sitting. So really my line of sight was more their legs than their upper body. And just having read this, it was perfect to observe without really being you know, a conscious observer. Plus I had my sunglasses on so they couldn't really see what I was looking at. But every time I saw them eat something, I could almost distinctly know whether they liked it or not. Now I can hear them conversing as well. But what I found fascinating is if I could turn off the listening and I would just watch their legs, when they ate something that they really liked, their feet started to move, they relaxed, they, they became happy feet. And then they would share something with the, you know, the chef and the GM and they would also relax. Uh, they would bring their legs up, they would sit back, they, you know, their legs would be coming forward, they would be, you know, tapping their feet, etc. Now, whenever they would taste something that they didn't like, their legs would pretty much always move behind the chair because they knew what they were about to say was going to make them feel uncomfortable. Ironically enough, or not ironically enough, perfectly enough, I should say, when they would share that information with the chef and the GM, watching how their feet reacted to the negative news also was pretty interesting. So the chef right away turned his body away from them and literally towards the exit towards the aisle and the GM would again move his feet behind the chair all of the things that Joe was mentioning in his book it was fascinating to watch really really amazing and it was really the first time I was like wow this stuff really happens and it was every time I mean they must have tasted like 15 or 20 dishes and literally I could almost by like the sixth one predict what was actually happening at that table it was wild so if you just want to observe your body I'll give you a cool little thing to witness your feet will shift towards people that you like and away from people or situations that you don't like. So just like the chef I was talking about was moving his feet towards the exit because he was made uncomfortable by that situation. So he turned away. So I'll give you a huge, huge tip, okay? A huge part of people feeling socially awkward is when you walk into a room, whether to network and you don't know that many people, you don't know if approaching a person, they are open to you being there or not open to you being there. So especially in networking situations, right? There's a lot of pockets where two people will be talking to each other and you kind of want to come in, right? Or a group of three people or whatever it is. And you, you want to come in and you just feel uncomfortable because sometimes you've walked into those situations and halfway through you're like, do they really want me to be here? Am I annoying them, etc. So I'm going to give you a massive tip on how you can quickly tell if people want you there for real or don't. So if you walk and you approach two people and you wave to them and you say hi, if they just turn their torso or hips to you, okay, like if they're talking to each other and all they do is they turn their hips to you, then that means they want to be left alone. If they open their feet to you and turn their entire body to you, that means they're fully welcoming you in. So if you've ever been out at a bar or a club or a networking event or whatever it might be and you walk into those situations, I'm telling you to now observe what happens to the body and not just what people are saying. Because if we've learned anything here is that people can deceive with their mouths and their faces as we'll learn, but they can't really deceive with their feet. The feet are telling. So if you learn nothing else from this podcast, 
I guarantee you, you go out and you try this and you'll be blown away. Plus, it'll put you at ease, right? Because if you know people are fully welcoming you, all that stuff, the chatter and crap that goes in your head, like, do they really want me here? Am I just annoying them? All that kind of stuff just goes away because you actually can trust the feet. In fact, Joe's actually taught this to uh, attorneys. So when they're trying to pick a jury or they're in trial, if jurors don't like a witness, they'll turn their feet towards the exits. If uh, people are disengaged from the conversation, they'll turn their feet away from you. So I'll give you another tip. If someone, you know when people put their feet in an L shape, if someone has one foot towards you and another one in an L shape, meaning like away from you, it means that they wanna leave or they wanna be somewhere else. So again, these are great tips that if you're in a conversation with someone, Every once in a while, you maybe just want to take a stare down and see where people's feet are because that'll give you an idea of whether they're engaged, they want to leave, etc. And it's kind of crazy. Like if someone was in that situation and are made feel uncomfortable and want to leave, and then you're the one that comes out and is like, hey, you know what? I just realized I got to go somewhere. You put them at ease and you get you actually allow them to do what it is that they want to do without having to put them in a weird situation. So just something to keep in mind. You know where this happens a lot is actually when I remember for me when I was in my previous business and I'd be talking to like a superior or, you know, a senior partner or whatever. And sometimes you just don't know if you're overstaying your welcome. You know what I mean? Like, and I think for people speaking to like a boss or something, we're always a little bit awkward where it's like, you don't want to be the first one to leave that conversation, right? It should be the other person's, but you can notice these things now and know when it's time for you to actually leave. So if you weren't sure before, this should give you a good idea of when it's time to actually leave. All right, so now let's just look at what other things feet can tell us, okay? So gravity-defying acts, as Joe Navarro puts it, are you know when people walk with a bounce in their step or rocking on the balls of their feet. He says, you know, rarely are you ever going to see a person who's clinically depressed, walking this way, okay? So again, telltale sign. Another one, leg splay, which is used for a territorial display. So if someone's legs go from feet together to far apart, it means that they're trying to take up more space. Very animalistic, right? So I'll give you another huge tip that Joe shared. When you're in a heated argument, okay, most people will generally be with their legs splayed, okay? If you wanna diffuse the argument, Move your feet together and watch how the argument completely dissipates. Because again, we're unconsciously attuned to these things. What I'm trying to do in this conversation, uh, in this po podcast, and just like Joe in his book, is to actually bring consciousness and awareness to this observation. Okay, so that's one. Now, like displays happen mostly because we're creatures who are very protective about our personal space. So having our personal space violated really, really upsets us. So if you ever notice if you're waiting in line and there's like people pushing and it's kind of uncomfortable, watch how you're holding yourself. Chances are your legs are going to be splayed because you're trying to take up more space. Okay. Now, when we're standing up and our legs are crossed is only when we feel very, very comfortable or confident. So if you ever see people standing and they'll have their legs crossed or one foot on top of the other, it means that they're very, very comfortable in that situation or with the people that they're with. Because when we cross our legs while standing, it means we're not balanced, right? So we've given up the balance, why? Because we don't feel threatened. When your legs are splayed, it's like you're standing there like, I'm ready, right? So. If you ever watch women in an elevator, okay? So say it's a strange woman in an elevator and a man will walk in, a woman will immediately uncross her legs and put them both down on the ground. It is just a knee jerk limbic brain reaction. So for those women listening, you know, pay attention to how you do that, okay? Um, now here are some tips with legs about intimate relationships or when you're dating because feet, again, can tell us a lot about these situations. So for example, during courtship, uh, you've probably seen a ton of this, but you've seen couples play footsies, right? So how many guys have ever dated and the woman has also dangled the shoe off her foot, right? Well, that tells you that she's really, really comfortable with you, which is an awesome, awesome sign. Um, playing footsies, I'll talk about in just a second, but I just want to cover a few more things. But there's 
a scientific reason why playing footsies is uh, so erotic. Also, if we, we can use that word. Um, all right, few few more. If you're seated with your legs crossed, if you're sitting side by side, notice which way your top legs are facing. If they're pointing towards each other, it means again that you're comfortable and you actually favor each other. So for all of you guys or girls dating and kind of like you want to know, does she like me? Does he like me? Blah, blah, blah. Is this going well? You can now start paying attention to the feet. Pretty cool, right? Now, why do people touch their feet under tables or in pools or under the covers in their bed? Because it's kind of this like out of sight, personal, private thing, right? Now, like I said before, there's science behind why playing footsies is arousing. Touching feet is arousing because lots of nerve endings in the foot actually send signal to the same part of the brain that is also controlled, that also controls the genitalia. So that the fact that we touch each other's feet is in fact arousing us because it's pretty much connected to our genitalia through the same part of the brain. Now, if we don't like a person, right, and they touch our feet, notice how fast you're going to pull your foot away. Very, very interesting. But if it's a lover or someone you're intimate with, etc., you know, feet playing is something that's been done for, again, millions of years. All right. So a couple more tips for you when you're first meeting people, because I know this, you know, helps people a lot with like the social anxieties part. When you first meet someone, one of three things is going to happen. Okay. You approach that person. If the person remains in place, right, then that means they're comfortable with the distance between you guys and with you. That's option one. Two, some people will actually take a step back from you, meaning they want more space or you want to start taking notice. They may want to be elsewhere. In other words, they don't want to be there with you. Or three, if they take a step closer towards you, is that it means that they're very, very favorable towards you. So just three cute little tips that as soon as you meet someone, you can gauge right away without them saying anything, but their feet will tell you whether they want to be there with you or not. Now, in addition, Joe had mentioned that there's 40 different walking styles, you know, things like stroll, limp, waddle, swagger, promenade, skip, just to name a few. But if you notice and you start observing people, you'll notice how when people get bad news or tragic news, how their walking style will completely change, right? Heavy, shoulders down, kind of trotting. Um, or likewise, on the flip side, if they get very positive news, you know, they're kind of like bouncing, got that bounce in their step, etc. So again, things to observe. Now, when you know all of these things, right, one of the commandments was to start looking for the clusters, start looking for when people put these actions together, because one is not really a telltale sign. But if they start stacking two or three, then you know, all of these things are leading you to something that person is uncomfortable, situation, environment, etc. So for example, if someone goes from a foot lock, okay, where their ankles are locked together into moving feet under the chair, and then into their palms and their thighs, then this is a cluster, right? Like three things in succession that basically guarantees you that that person you're in front of is uncomfortable either by particular situation or the question, or maybe even you. So again, ultimately this all boils down to observation is the key. And this is the muscle that I'm hoping you can, you know, start working on because for anyone in any sort of sales position that has to deal with person to person sales, I mean, this book is an absolute must just by knowing these little things. Think about how much time you would save yourself in only interacting with the right people. So again, observation is key. So those are just, I want to end it there and, and we'll end part one there. And I'm not sure if I'll have another one part or two parts in, in talking about the other takeaways, but um, those are just some of my takeaways on feet from this genius book, what everybody is saying um, in part two will be stepping, if I can use that pun, uh, away from feet and moving into other nonverbal behaviors of the body, things like hands, torso, face, etc. So hope you've enjoyed this. To me, this was some of the most fascinating things I've ever heard. I've never heard anything like this up until reading this book. I've actually reached out to Joe personally 
he's agreed to be on the performance enhancing podcast in the near future. Uh, I don't know when that'll be. I'm hoping to have it done sometime in May. But in the meantime, I think it's incredible information that anyone can use uh, in their lives because we all, at the end of the day, interact with other humans. So having this understanding of this other part of nonverbal behavior gives us a huge, huge uh, performance boost. All right. So with that, we'll wrap up this performance enhancing podcast. Have an amazing, amazing day, guys, and I'll see you on the next pep talk. Bye, everyone. Thank you for joining us on this week's Performance Enhancing Podcast. We've taken this pep talk and created a custom action guide so you know exactly what action steps to take now to grow your business. Just head over to satoriprime.com slash podcast and download it for free. Also, please leave a comment and rate this podcast on iTunes. It'll help us get the word out. Thanks for listening. Now, go and implement. We'll see you next time.